So, good, a good evening. Today I'm going to talk to you about Linux kernel virtualization and the surrounding tool set that you need to use with it. So KVM is just the hypervisor piece and it's kind of integrated with the Linux kernel. It loads the kernel module and it's uh, the development of it has a lot of cross-pollination with the actual kernel developers. But just by itself, it's not very useful because it's just the ability for the kernel to run the virtual machine. So we're talking about a stack. So, a typical stack con consists of a couple of components. Uh, obviously, you have the kernel-based hypervisor, which is itself kind of providing a backend for a QEMU. And these actually are supposed to be two separate slides here. Uh, and the libvirt API, which is uh, an API for managing virtual things that actually supports more than just KVM, but also supports Zen, for example. Also, a couple other things uh, bridge networking and a couple of command line tools, uh, especially Versh and the Virtual Machine Manager GUI, which you'll see some screenshots of much later in the talk. <coughs> okay, so. so the QEM here, which is probably the oldest component of the stack, can emulate other hardware. It doesn't run very fast when it's doing this, but it can do it. So you can actually do something like an ARM on your x86 based computer. Uh, it's, it dates back to 2003. Um, You can run uh, different OSs emulating different architectures. But when you backend QMU with K either KVM or Zen, you get really good performance, at least on that matching architecture. Libvirt is the API. It's your toolkit to manage your virtualization platforms. It's got the API is accessible from a whole bunch of languages, supports a lot of backends, including Behave. <laughs> And it runs on quite a lot of platforms. So we're here mainly to talk about KVM, at least as your hydrolyzer backend. And the performance is pretty good. It's typically about, estimated to be about 5% versus running bare metal. Uh, 
uh, obviously some benchmarks will say that it's You went backwards one before. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So uh, do I need to go back or forward? Yeah. Where where you should be. That's what we're talking about now. Yeah. Okay. So obviously not all benchmarks agree. Uh, when I was checking into that, uh, the benchmark discussion I just found on the ARM side is that it's got a significant performance hit on ARM, but you're probably not looking to do ARM for your virtualization platform right now, although maybe some people are. <laughs> yes. Uh, at least from what I was able to read from the few discussions I found, uh, you won't get the same uh, near hardware speed out of ARM, but it'll work. And it's been around for a while now, like a decade or so, and those who use it consider its performance to and stability to be pretty good. Like, this is what uh, most of the VPS industry is using. Uh, Google, Amazon, but also most of your independent VPS providers are using KVM. So Linode and DigitalOcean. And Linode switched from that. So they actually had to rebuild everything to go from Zen to KVM. Uh, a couple of other names, uh, Volter, Dreamhost, Bluehost, HostGator. Interestingly, Rackspace bought Slicehost, uh, which was Zen, and made them VMware ESX. But I suspect that Rackspace in particular had a customer base that wanted VMware backing them, and because they're such a big provider in that corporate space, I, I suspect they got a good deal from VMware on the license and can move slices over to VMware. Uh, the, the one place where I Find performance is not great, and we we're discussing this last month, is on video rendering. And if you're doing a business application, it's fine. But if you're doing a multimedia application, like uh, something that's going to render 3D stuff, uh, a game that's depending on hardware acceleration, your video performance is going to um, and it's just not suitable for that uh, possible workaround is there is support for having, giving KVM direct access to a video card. Uh, so in general it doesn't use the video card if you've got one? No. no. Okay. <coughs> so for things that don't require um, the kinds of things that graphics cards accelerate and offload, it's fine. It's doing everything. It's doing the video rendering in your CPU, and as long as it's stuff that the video things that the CPU doesn't suck at, or that just requires so much processing power that it's going to bog down uh, if you're not uploading into a graphics processor, uh, you're fine. Which is Keek was able to demonstrate that compressed video remotely on KVM backend. Performance wasn't great, you definitely would have chosen for your home theater, but if you had to watch an instructional video in your desktop, virtual desktop environment, it, it, it would be terrible. <coughs> so, of course, a lot of people are interested in this for building their home lab. Is the type of application that does benefit from the 
cores. Uh, it's going to be slow if you have a bunch of stuff doing and you've only got a dual core mach machine. Even if you have a ton of RAM in it, your processor is going to bottleneck. But this parallelizes really well. Um, for this talk, I actually started playing with CentOS, but CentOS had some disagreement with the hardware I was using for the <laughs> box I was actually working on for the talk. And, and so uh, you're getting a Debian Ubuntu specific version here because um, I, I just wasn't ready to deal with CentOS not like There was actually something I wanted to look at, uh, a virtualization tool from Red Hat. No one works on Red Hat or Enterprise or CentOS. So um, uh, we're getting my home environment, my server is Debian stable, uh, my desktop is current Linux Mint. Which is built on Bionic. And I brought up a Cosmic box while working through the, making sure I documented all the steps and had somebody to take screenshots from for the talk. So, uh, one thing is that I am not putting sudo before every command you need to run as root. Most things will need to run as root, so whether you'd like to SQL or sudo, I would leave that to you. <coughs> now, the first thing you have to do is make sure virtualization is turned on in your BIOS, because if it's not turned on, you won't get hardware virtualization. And most systems ship with it off by default. So you buy a nice shiny new computer from Newegg or Best Buy, and it's there, and you turn it on, and KVM's not going to run because not because the new AMD or Intel processor in the box doesn't support it, but because you haven't sent this thing in flag in your BIOS. And Ubuntu ships a convenient utility for checking that, uh, but generally you're going to be poking around your BIOS. So the first thing you're going to set up after you've got your OS installed and you're ready to go is bridge network. So I've got a nice quote from the Linux Foundation's wiki explaining what a bridge is. And since in most cases you're going to want your guests in the virtual host to be able to be seen by other boxes that are not the host box. This is especially true if you have a dedicated host box that's probably headless or has like, well, I can switch one of my monitors to the other input and plug in a USB keyboard if I really need to be on this box, but it's mostly headless. So if you're on Ubuntu, the first thing you want to need to deal with is the fact that Ubuntu has replaced the traditional interfaces file with something called NetPlan. And also, most distributions are now using System Keys Resolver name, which I actually think might even be better than the old resolver daemon. Uh, but net plan, I think, is an awful idea. 
So you're going to either want to back out of the system to resolve or DNA payment, or learn to live with it. Uh, but you are getting rid of net plan, even if you like net plan. Uh, I, I saw no documentation while I was working on this on how you would set up a bridge with net plan. I'm sure somebody's made it work. So. Sorry, I can barely see my slides on this desktop <laughs> when it's in prison. So I've got my notes. Okay. So um, you probably do want to do the new way, which is to add, and you can, there's actually several variations on the new way, but for this case, I would suggest doing it in your resolve deep configuration because this is the most specific and granular place to do it. And uh, it's got a nice extra thing in that you can set a fallback DNS. So instead of just setting a group of DNS servers, that's the IP address of a private DNS server. I run a private DNS server at my house. That's normally what I want my things to talk to. But if for some reason that's down and this VM is up, well, wouldn't it be awesome if it would look at Google or Cloudflare's public DNS service in that case, so that at least it can resolve names that aren't local? And that's not a very hard configuration. If you want to go back to the old way, you need to install a package resolve com, delete the symlink stub, stub at Etsy resolve com, create a new Etsy resolve com, fit, and then you need to mask <coughs> system D resolve because uh, with these system D services, a service that you don't want running if you just disable it can still be requested by another unit file. So the mask command is really useful here. It tells system D that no. Somebody tries to start this, I want you to lie to them and say it's running. Without running it. <laughs> Which is actually kind of cool. Uh, I ultimately love and hate system date, but this is something I definitely like about it that you can do that. Then you're going to need to switch to interfaces and install a bridge. So on Ubuntu, you've got to install legacy interfaces as well as the bridge utilities. Then you want to mask off Network Manager if this is on your desktop. If you're on a server that's got no X windows, you don't have to worry about Network Manager. But if you're doing this on your workstation for the first time to do it, uh, as I was doing on my demo box, uh, you don't want Network Manager. And if you try to uninstall Network Manager, you will destroy your system. I, I, I just never installed <coughs> it. Well, I, I'm good to, uh, and then if you try to remove Network Manager, you will lose your system. That may not be true on other distributions. It may even not be true on Debian's base. So you. Do you actually need this single network manager, or can when you're making your configs, you can put in the setting and say network manager isn't allowed to manage this in your case? I have found that when I want to configure 
networking manually. Net man work manager is a problem. I'll and second. I'll, I'll second that. Yeah. I, I would not. If you're setting a static configuration, which if you're using this as a virtualization host, you want to always be at the same same IP address, and you have to use interfaces with bridge network. Mm -hmm. So even though you could do a simple static configuration, okay, with network manager. Network manager, I do not believe there's any awareness or understanding of bridging. I could be wrong on that, but I'm not aware of it having support for bridging. So you're asking for a load of trouble to let network manager run. You're depending it's not on the hassle. I've, I've done that. It's just avoid. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, network manager, if it sees a configured interfaces file, will generally respect it, but on your little applet pane, it will show you the network manager configuration as being the running configuration and not say, hey, we're configured through interfaces. I'm going to show you what's configured, but you can't change it because I'm read-only. It will actually show you the configuration that it would have running, if it was running, and make you think that that's the active configuration. So once we've gotten Network Manager out of the way, and if you were running with Network Manager, you were momentarily without network access, you're going to edit the interfaces file. And you're going to basically disable your primary Ethernet by setting it to manual and configure the bridge virtual interface, which is then going to actually take over your normal interface. So I used E0 in this example, but of course we have the unpredictable names feature to contend with, which is that to deal with the problem of interfaces not coming up with the same ETH port assignment across boots, uh, System D and friends decided that they would use how System D interprets the slot position of the card instead of a MAC address and some sort of mapping table, which I think most of them. Now, arguably the MAC address isn't as reliable as it might have used to have been because a lot of cards support changing the MAC address. But if you actually reconfigure your box, the slot mapping is also not going to hold. So the fact that they shoehorned you this, we're going to map it to a physical address and give you a name, which is to you, random, it doesn't, isn't the right solution. Doesn't UDEV do all that? It does. It does. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can configure UDEV if you need to. Yeah. Okay. That's the proper way to do it. Right. But we've got unpredictable names foist on us. No, that's how you make it predictable. <laughs> you hack you to have rules. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What what is that Etsy UDEV or where, where is it? Etsy UDEV. Etsy UDEV and it's the was it the seventy rules? <coughs> So in Etsy UDEV, you can control the naming. Yeah. There, there's That's a worth a lightning bolt, Chris. <laughs> uh, also, on top of that, those names are not random. They're always the same yeah. based on the... Yes, yeah, so they're consistent across boots. But you don't, You have to find out what your interface is called. Right. right. IP adder. It's not that hard. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but when I started IPA. doing this, I hadn't read the... No, that's what we're drinking later. I, there, there's two, but I mean, to, to CJ's point, you, it, you can make it persistent. Some, 
you don't have to. You, if you, if you, um, because your interface names are always also always going to be stable, you can still do what you're doing in a traditional way. But the fo the way forward is make it static in in UDEF. Oh, sorry, it's live UDEF. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. just yeah. type by feed address yeah. so you will let you find out what the interfaces yeah. and your box are. That's the UDEV mm -hmm. rules. And you will use whatever the interface is instead of eat zero because um, unless you take their advice and start hacking around at the you know, uh, it's not good to be named eat zero anymore. So once we've done that and we've successfully brought the network back online, you're going to install virtualization. And I've got a long list of packages. I'll give you the URL you can find the slide set to get the list of packages. And uh, let's just go over them. So you've got your main QEM, U, KVM package. We're just going to bring in KVM, QEM U, you've got add uh, two packages for with vert. Uh, vert is, is a uh, utility with vert clients, utility. Um, uh, now I should use some bullet. Uh, QEM utils, which is more utilities on the QEM U side. But that's why they're not brought in by the main package, but uh, you'll probably reach a point of frustration when like, if you decide to resize an image or something and find QMU. IMG is not there. So you want that. An OVMF is the support for being able to do an EFI boot in your virtualization environment. And then you're on a client, you want clients, you also want a bunch of viewers. <coughs> so since we installed EFI, we actually have to edit a configuration file to turn it on. Uh, because it's not only not installed, but it doesn't see that it's there and turn it on when it is. Uh, so now that we've done all this, it's a good time to reboot. And make sure everything comes up. If you've applied patches, it'll be loading. You'll get your new kernel version loaded, and all of that stuff. And then you're logged in. First thing you may want to do is to find a storage pool. Um, the default storage location is going to do default to uh, a libvert lib file somewhere which may not be uh, depending on whether you're running with one big volume or if you have uh, different physical volumes uh, may not be where you want big VM images to go by default. So, these are the commands. Uh, the first is get a define it. Uh, you can list your pools. You can start the pool. You can set it as an auto start, which you want to do. And that's that for that slide. So, some people may really want to work on the command line. And if you really want to launch a guest completely from the command line, there's the bird install tool that will take a lot of arguments off the command line to do this. But here's an example. Uh, and it'll create a machine named Debian 980. It'll create a disk Debian 980 QCAL in the pool. <coughs> Uh, we're asking it to be in the main pool, which is our defined pool, and not the default OS pool. 
And optionally, if you want to skip defining a pool, you could plug in the disk path. What, what do the pools do for you? They, they seem to be more of a confusing feature, I think, than a really helpful feature. But they do let you t have the uh, liver managed environment know about multiple storage locations so that you can refer to them by pool in a case like this where you're defining a client on command line. Um, virtual machine manager uh, requires that you add any locations that you want to have virtual machines in to a pool, though maybe the, if you're managing your machines through the Versh client, uh, it's not absolutely imperative that you actually have them defined in a pool. Um, it's just something you just sort of have to get used to. But this is how they've decided that storage is going to okay. be So it helps you manage storage and maybe other things. Yeah. So when you finish the install, uh, you can uh, go back to another console and uh, if your machine doesn't shut down when you ask it to, uh, which sometimes guests don't, you can use the verse destroy, which is the same as turning it off. It's a little confusing. Destroy, you would think, uh, would remove the machine. Force off might have been a clearer description. Uh, shutdown sends the ask the OS to shut down, uh, which then you get in the same problem if the OS fails to successfully send the active power off signal at the end of its shutdown. You have a machine that's kind of in that almost but not completely off state. You need the ACPI on the guess, right? Um, uh, yeah. It's, uh, if, if it's a problem, there's probably some tweaking you can do somewhere. To, but if it, but I just run first list, and if somebody's failed to shut down in a reasonable time, I'll just go ahead and destroy them. Now, if you really want to remove the machine, Undefined is what you would have expected Destroyer to have done. So now that you've got your machine there, you can view the configuration. And if I'm managing machines on the command line, I'm much more likely to edit versus XML. So I'll take the machine I have that's got a complete version XML, figure out what I need to change, and I'll use the first command create a new machine from that XML file. Or I'll cheat and put it in the configuration directory when KVM is restarted, it'll see it. Um, but this time we, we set it up our command line one without any graphics, which when you want to use the GUI tools as a problem because it doesn't have a console that can connect to. So add a graphics adapter um, and that's an example of what you need to do to add a graphics adapter. So QEMU supports two graphics rendering there's VNC, which is old, and Spice, which is new and shiny and performs better and has some features that VNC doesn't have. Now, I found that in the past on uh, my Ubuntu systems, uh, there were issues, issues with Spice, and I actually have uh, an article I wrote recently about dealing with 
some of that. I did find on Cosmic that they finally seem to have fixed the Spice Viewer within Virtual Machine Manager. And if you had a guest that was configured with Spice, you could just get to its console and Virtual Machine Manager rather than having to bring up another viewer that could actually, that actually had a function in Spice Client. So now you launch the Virtual Machine Manager GUI. And when, now that you're trying to run things not as root, you may find that even though you should have added yourself to the Libvirt group, you still have a permissions problem because things that need to be rewrite did not get that permission and you need to go set it by hand. So again, the slide can direct you to what you need to check the permissions on. Now, once you're in Versh, you can go look at your some of the properties of your host. I'll give you a little CPU usage thing, and you can click over the storage tab, and you can see the pools you define and the images you've got. <coughs> And then you can go create a new guest. Uh, you get a screen like that. Install something locally. Uh, nice, pretty pictures. And eventually, you follow through everything. Is there anything? Before you let it go, I always click the button that says let me view the details before you create this virtual machine. And that is where, in fact, the thing I wanted to point out was. So we went through the trouble of turning UFDI support on. You need to now actually go click something in the first overview screen to say that you want to use U UEFI. And then you can go launch your machine, and you have your basic working home lab. I've got a bunch of useful links on the last slide. And you can find everything at techinfo.rainbows.org. Hmm. Uh, any questions? Sure. That's a question. So, Oh, if you're, unless you're like AWS or Lino or someone, why why do this at all? Why not just run a Docker instance or um, or just a just a daemon to do whatever you want? Why 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 create an entire uh, virtual machine? <laughs> what what are the advantages of doing well, that? Well, so. Docker's containerization, which actually runs off of LXC, LXC, which is another part of supporting virtualization. You can do a lot of things with just the, uh, you know, sort of like the you, know, you could you know, you do something with the game and it would be two slides instead of 32 slides. And well, so, like, it's, it's, you know, it's not trivial to set up. And so what, what do you gain by doing all this? So you... I can actually answer that. If you're, if you're getting increased uh, isolation once you're trying to run, you don't really get new containers. There's a certain limit to that. Right. Um, the other thing is, is I mean, for what I'm working on, I need to use something like that for doing just getting a basic uh, image out. So I can just use a uh, change group on it. 
and do something on ARM device or <coughs> updated that kind of stuff without running it on native hardware, that kind of stuff, which means to me, moving me physical media around to try to get done versus like my big chunky box or the four times. Yeah, yeah th this is, I mean, there's really no reason to use physical hardware if you don't have to. Because most people, like if you're, if you're thinking service, like I understand what you're saying, like from a desktop point of view, why would a regular user do this? But I mean, I can tell you that like, you know, servers generally, if you've got people that are running just file and print servers, okay, or just doing basic things, why not harness that power for other things? So you start increasing the density of your system. Um, seg so you start segmenting your system, carving, carving up those resources so that they're a little bit better suited. But one of the uh, questions was, why not just use a container? And because a container it may not be appropriate for the. For, like for I this. said, it, you can increase isolation, plus containers didn't exist when this entire project was <coughs> started. Well, well, not only that, containers and virtual machines are not equal. Con yeah, contain not equal at all. No, not at all. Not, yeah, not, not even close. The, the, the point of using virtual systems is that you can maximize the resources on your systems. Perfect example, if, if I have to demo something that's five different servers, let's say I'm you know, putting together something where I need an identity server, file and print server, web server, you know, add three more things to that. Okay, where am I, am I actually gonna go to six different pieces of hardware and do this, or am I gonna do a virtual machine build my base. One thing John can cover here is cloning. So once you do this, it's very easy to clone that system as your base. And now I can create as many systems as I want based off of this one thing, take my virtual networking and isolate that completely separate. So I basically have a virtual lab, my virtual network, and I can do whatever I want in there. Run my DHCP server and, and basically model an entire environment Virtually, without with, with uh, I mean, it takes right now. It looks longish, but we're doing one. If you if you have to do twenty of these or thirty of these, and, you know, it, it it starts to make a, a lot more sense. And there's a lot of stuff that containers just don't do. So if you need to run a window uh, a Windows server in your virtual lab, you're not going to containerize this. Um, if you have, say, I want to try this on BSD. You can't do that in a container. So yeah, if you're on a similar generation of container uh, of, <coughs> of hardware and uh, kernel, you can run Red Hat on a Windows <coughs> container, but you're not running BSD on a Windows container. Also, containers have tend to have inherently a problem with uh, persistent storage, whereas yes. <coughs> VMs absolutely just, yeah. it's a virtual like you. Uh, that's well, so that's less of a problem now. Yeah. What? But a container, you just have to mount outside. Of it. yeah. It's, it's, yeah, no, that's, that's a problem. But that's the thing. It's like inherent. Like you have to do something. You have to plan for it. But the VM. Uh, that's persistent storage. Is that's it? less. The, that's less of a problem now. Um, especially, well, especially well, you can you can dynamically add storage out inside the container. Well, yeah, it's yeah. just volume storage. The thing is, uh, yeah. that's a question of infrastructure. That kind right. of stuff. Right. And I mean, for a developer, overall, a container is going to do a lot of what they need to well, until there's some special use cases that you need to. Yeah. Because, um, yeah. It's, it's Isn't defaultly a container's cap, right? Copy on right? No. No. I thought it was, yeah. No. Well, I don't know what the ones are, but I mean, isn't a lot of them? Because uh, I was going to say, that's where you get problems. I mean, it's meant to be a mini. A container is not a box, so you have advantages <coughs> yeah. on having a right. box. The yeah. so container it gives you advantages in a container, but then that be advantage becomes a disadvantage if you're looking at it. From there the are ways yeah. to treat a container yeah. like a VM. For, for ABSD, mm -hmm. jail is being one of them. Actually. Your end spawn gets closer so, yeah. to a Oh, end spawn, you can, you can do exactly what you can no, do whatever but, you want. No, the, 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 the reason why I bring up FreeBSD jails is because it act, because it actually combines, like these days, it can combine certain features of ZFS. Specifically, right. you, can, you, can designate, you can designate one or more ZFS data sets to only be for that jail. And and that's completely isolated from even the host system. Well, that was the initial term. He said uh, containers were uh, jails on steroids. 
So I mean that. No, no, jails were CH. Yeah, CH is yeah. Linux is actually very similar to BSD jails. Yeah. And it's actually what Docker uses to implement itself. So when you're running Docker, you're really running LXC, except that Docker is a completely different. Entity. Although if I were you, I would start getting away from Docker specific stuff. Being, you know, it pissed off a lot of people. <laughs> so, so I think um, security would be one reason. Any anything you want to do that you want to isolate from your environment, either a server environment or a desktop, you know, um, for experimentation. You know, you can install Red Hat and CentOS and Fedora, Ubuntu, Fedora, no, you, you can, know, it, it, you can you install the, up, you, anything you want. And you you can, can install whatever user land you want on, like, uh, as long as that user land matches your kernel. Right. That's the, that's the limitation. You, you yeah, you're talking about, like you're talking about for containers, yeah, yeah, yeah. For VMs, you could do it. Yeah. For for VMs, it that all depends. Yeah, I, I can tell you for for the, those of you who are security folks, I as a rule, I don't run any Microsoft on bare metal anymore. It's all virtualized. That's and a good I, idea. Yeah. What, yeah. what do you get? Then? And that's what's the, what's the benefit? What's the benefit? What's the benefit? Yeah. Yeah, because that means the root kit that they throw on there. Still using the same. You know what the benefit is? I will. I will. How about, so when I give my talk on guacamole, I'll show you exactly what the benefit is. Snapshots. That's, 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 that's one of the biggest. Security wise. Security. Yeah, security wise. How is it helping you security? Because how do you fix a Windows machine that's been compromised? Turn it off. It, it, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Actually, okay. No, 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 no. It depends no, no, on what the problem is, I guess. Valid as the, in engineering, we call it the trivial solution. Now, the real solution is what? Once a box has been compromised, any box, what do you do? You shut it off wipe it. No, it wipe it. You wipe it. Okay. Wiping it is doing what? Starting from scratch. Right. Right? But it's wait, 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 wait. It'll make it'll make a sense in a second. If you're doing virtual if you're doing virtualization and I snapshot something from when it was installed. Okay? I know. That box can get compromised one second after that. You know how I fix it? Reload the snapshot. Okay, now wait a second. But let's say I'm the guy from Romania yeah. whacking your machine. Yeah. You put that same machine up. I'm looking at it. I'm going to whack it again. How do you know? Because I'm going to be constantly looking at that machine. You're gonna, yeah, you're going to be attacking my Windows guest, which means that, so. Well, if I'm not getting anything, I'm going to go somewhere else. The, the, one of the things that people, the, the power of this here allows you to do something that most people don't realize. I can have my virtual infrastructure isolated to a private network and my guests on a public network. If you do that, your guests, your host cannot be attacked. It's out of band, okay? It's out of band, it cannot be attacked. So you're attacking the guests. If I'm snapshotting, I'm doing some other things. What it allows me to do, if I have a compromise, I can go right back to my previous snapshot. Anytime I update a Windows box, I snapshot it. Which means that in case, you, in case you blow it up, then you can come back. It gets hacked, ransomware, anything. Get a call. We think we have ransomware. Oh, do you? Wait, Reload a snapshot. But Done. The time, from the time you have the snapshot to the work they did, mm -hmm. ransomware is sure. gone. Yes. Yeah. It could be. But here's the thing. How long does it take you to build a Windows box? Or any I understand snapshots. I'm just saying it doesn't make you more secure. It does make you more secure. It's still wide open to all the default that Microsoft has. It, it makes you, the reason why it, it makes you. It doesn't make you secure once I get your credit card. Okay, so, all right, so, in, okay, in terms of security, one of the things that you have to be concerned with is what they call resilience, right? I have to keep services up. If, if, if services are up, and let's say I have data siloed elsewhere, and I'm doing things there, okay? Between the two. You snapshot your systems, you version your data. You can recover very quickly from an attack. So it's two, it's, it's both. Not just backup, it's ver you have to version. But you combine these things and you layer your, your stuff. You, you build that secure environment. Virtuals, virtualizing and what that, that capability that that gives you adds to this. Speed to get back. That's called resilience. That's called resilience. Yes. And, and if you got a hardware bug and they hack the hardware, making your hardware rent unrenderable, you have to throw the hardware out and buy new hardware. I thought they got into the ID control from the hard drive. Right. You throw the hardware out, but if you're virtualized, you move. You move that. As a matter of fact, 
QEMU has a process, if you're running DRBD actually, you can migrate your VM, so you're actually not ever down. Right. So, and, and you don't have to throw out your hardware and start again. But it's hardware agnostic. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. That's, you have to, you, if, if, can you, can you think about this? If, you're, if you've got your server and it goes down, and you could just take that file and put it someplace, and it's back up again, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what it says. You know the deal. Yeah. So, but it doesn't help you if it doesn't, if yeah, you don't yeah, pack your Microsoft software, and you've got yeah. funky software that's vulnerable. It, it helps you because as the person tasked with fixing the problem, it gets you there quicker and allows you to remain in So if you've got somebody who's using some bug and looking at everybody's password, mm -hmm. Yeah, virtualization yeah, doesn't fix a yeah, problem in the OS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. It's, it's, not, it, it's not. It's part of. It's part of the. It's part of the things that you can do. It gives you an additional capability. <laughs> Generally, you just use the same thing as what what you would run. Zen had an issue that you had to compile a special kernel right. to run the Zen gas. That was one of the advantages of using KVM is that it will just use your stuff. I thought they have a kernel module now. That, that. that may well be. No, the that's for when Zen came out. That's just for like. That's just for like accelerating certain certain uh, uh, hardware okay. interfaces, yeah. but like but for the for, but for the basic. For the basic virtualization functionality, you don't need any of that. Did you do this on bare metal? You start. You put this on bare metal. So the hypervisor is going to be on bare metal. You did you install Ubuntu? Was that what you said? You installed Ubuntu first. You you were going to install Ubuntu or Debian, okay. or if you're really brave and need to translate my slides to an unrelated system, will Arch or okay. Red Hat or okay. CentOS works on your hardware. CentOS, uh, and then you're going to use. So, the beauty of kernel virtualization is that it's got almost no overhead, but it runs in a Linux kernel. So, you can bring up a Linux host that's all your standard Linux stuff that gives you pretty much the performance of a bare metal hypervisor like ESX. Okay, so. You put your Ubuntu on, then you went through those steps. Then you mentioned Debian. Maybe. You mentioned Debian. Did you Debian. Debian. So Debian and Ubuntu are really closely related. Right. Yeah. So uh, you might find that uh, there's one package extra that you have to install on Debian. Uh, so Ubuntu is still running the system, then the QEMU is on top of it, allowing you to install these. The VMs. KVM, which is kernel module, QEMU, and Libvirt work together as a tool set to give your Linux box this functionality that's VMs. competitive with VMware, which is completely open source. It seems to me that, it seems to me that, if I'm understanding this right, that this is really useful for the hardware. Because there are easier ways to spin up the virtual machine you don't need the hardware. And then, as everyone was saying, for a lot of things, you can just do a container. Well, uh, what do you mean easier? Uh, okay, so, so it, might be, it might be that I'm missing some features that the virtual this machines tool have here. This tool is one of the easiest ways for how a virtual system is deployed. If you go, and what John started out with the presentation is, is that a lot of these tools are, for, are beefed up or forked projects that Amazon or Google Cloud uses or Azure uses. So when you say, I want a server with X amount of specs, the back end is really this software. Well, so again, there are a lot of ways to do virtual machine, right? So like if you just want to be in a world, like if you're a gnome, right? Mm -hmm. Like gnome has boxes, right? So you can just take an ISO, pop something open, right? Okay. Gnome, so that, no, that's Gnome, Box, server, right? Gnome Boxes uses all of this as the back end, though. Good. Yeah. So, so, so Boxes, up. yeah, so I guess that's interesting. Yeah, so I didn't know that. It's just, just think of it as another way to build. If you, if you, however many computers you have at home, this capability gives you more but to play around with. In other words, you know what I mean? The simplest, least amount of garbage that you yeah. have to go through in terms of like GUIs, whatever. 
and the most amount of control you're going to have for launching any type of virtual machine. So if you got a headless setup and you just want to, you just want the most efficient way to launch a virtual machine, this is what I would use. Yeah, I would learn to edit the verse XML files, mm -hmm. and I would use verse to set so it. And you can do, and you can do I, I, like I don't, I use all command line stuff for this, and it's 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 much quicker. Like there's a lot of different ways to do it. So say say you're on say you're on your laptop yeah, and you want to. Bare bones hypervisor kernel. I mean, why are you? There need? is, but if you still want to use that sys the host or something else, oh. like the idea is, do you just want to compartmentalize? Some of the hardware resources yeah. for something. Even for so, bare bones, you know, because, like I have a server, but all it does is serve virtual images. And mm -hmm. yeah. it, it, it's nice that when I go and administer the machine, I'm using familiar tools. Mm -hmm. and I can connect my virtual machine manager from my desktop to it, mm -hmm. or I can go into a console and use search mm -hmm. to manage stuff. Yeah. I've got like all these tools, maybe they're not quite as polished as VMware tools, the but best for command line stuff, I think they're better. And the best way I would use it is, like, let's say you are using a lot of uh, containers, and let's say you have a lot of different hosts that use different, you know, base, or different, like, you know, distros from the base itself. You can test to make sure that your Docker commands will work the same on that system as any other, because there are times it will come back to haunt you. With and I was just going to say that the, um, just do a step back. Uh, developers love this because, in other words, if they're developing something on Box, mm, yeah. that's when Bayer came around. And Bayer was mm -hmm. more than the hands to these different well, things. Google has yeah. images that you can use QMU for their developer environments mm -hmm. because, like, they have entire. But, yeah, all yeah. I'm saying is the Vert stuff because then you can get you have a box which has all the libraries because usually that's what bites every developer mm -hmm. in the ass. That's actually so how you I turn around and say, and that's where. A vagrant came later, but I'm using that as an example. Vagrant was very big for developers to go blah blah blah, yeah. pull up a box on your box. And do your stuff, and everyone has the same damn box. And yes. there's also so people who develop the, the VMs, yeah. and you can but actually you go from virtual disk. Mm -hmm. You can actually map that to a physical disk. Right. So do those, do those. So I guess what I'm wondering about is the hardware emulation. So like, you could you like on a Linux machine like fire up something that's like. Windows? Like a Pi, and see like the yeah, Pi they have, devices. They have the, actually, the whole Android, Android Studio, yeah. when you go to use that emulator, the back end is this. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, yeah, QEMU has different processor emulations. Yeah. So we're talking about the x86-64 stuff here. But it's got ARM, it's got MIPS, it's got, other, it's got other ones. So yeah. when you've got this set up to do your, Excel, your fast for your x86 stuff, but if you need to pull in another processor, if that processor is supported by QEMU, mm -hmm. you can emulate that processor. It will run slow because it's software emulation, mm -hmm. but you will be able to emulate that processor on the box. I can tell you right now, this because of the use and abuse of this for that hardware emulation, there are entire, actually uh, for a while, Raspbian was actually built all on QEMU, not yeah. on native hardware because they didn't have access to it. So the entire distro was built, tested, and that was causing other issues with certain packages. So, yeah. which they fixed a lot of it, but the, also the performance for building and that kind of stuff is being discussed. Yeah, yeah, all, it, it gives you something that before containers came around, if I wrote an application and wanted to give it to you, I could give you the VM oh, yeah. file if you want to play and you launch it in, in like VirtualBox yeah. or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Historically, you have to understand this framework, which a lot of people forget is that when Unix came around, it decimated, in other words, everything used to be mainframes. And mainframes, you would get a vert space. In other words, if you oh, yeah, get the yeah. mainframe, you'd get this yeah. chunk. So what happened is you'd have to get this big-ass book with box. And so